The Old Guard, Book 1, Opening Fire, written by Greg Rucka, art by Leandro Fernandez. All right, The Old Guard, written by Greg Rucka, is a comic over at Image, and it has been adapted into a movie on Netflix starring Charlize Theron. I believe Netflix is working on a sequel, which will adapt Volume 2 of the comic. So in this video, I will be breaking down the story for Volume 1, and next week I will return and cover Volume 2 of this series as well. At the end of this video, I'm going to be breaking down my thoughts on the differences between the movie and the comic. I gotta say, I really enjoyed the concept of this book. It is really cool. It's about these immortal warriors that live forever. I'm always fascinated by the concept of people that live forever and what the passage of time is like to them, seeing their loved ones die and how do they go on for all these many years. So that is quite fun to explore within this series. There's also tons of action and killing, which are really fun as well. All right, let's dive into the story for Volume 1, Opening Fire. Old Guard Origins so I reordered the story a little bit for the sake of this video. The origins of our various main characters are spread out over the first five issues, but I decided to go through these origins up front instead. So I'm beginning with the various origin stories of our main characters in the past before we dive into the present day. So the Old Guard is in reference to a series of warriors throughout history that were cursed with immortality. No one knows why they were cursed, or chosen, or how it happened, or for sure how many of them are out there in the world. In the book, the Immortals are referred to as Immortals, as well as Relics. Our main character is Andy, otherwise known as Andronika the Scythian. She is the oldest of these immortal warriors that we know of. She has dark hair and is very beautiful. She was played by Charlize Theron in the movie. Andy has been alive for nearly 7,000 years. At one point, she was even worshipped as a god. She cannot die, at least not yet. If she gets shot in the head or something, she may appear to die momentarily, but her body will heal and she will come back. There are only a handful of these immortals that we know of. The immortals also tend to have dreams of each other that eventually cause them to meet and find each other. A few thousand or so years ago, during the days of the Byzantine Empire, Andy dreamt of another immortal warrior, a Japanese woman named Noriko. In the movie, she was a Vietnamese woman named Queen. While well, Andy dreamt of this Noriko for years, until one day, the two finally found each other, and they spent many years together, perhaps a few hundred, perhaps a thousand or so, until one day, Noriko went overboard on a ship, and she was presumed dead. No way she could survive that. Later on, Andy met another immortal warrior named Lycon. They had been dreaming of each other for only a few weeks, and then they got lucky and found each other. They worked together, the two of them, for almost 2,000 years. Until one day, during the Renaissance, Lycon died. And this time, he did not come back to life. He stayed dead. He stopped healing. And Lycon, he looked relieved that it, his life was finally over. So these immortal warriors, they can die eventually, for real. But they don't know when it will happen when their time will finally be up, when they will be dealt a lethal blow and finally not come back from it. This Lycon finally died and didn't come back, but not Andy, not yet. She has died many times herself, but she always came back. Aside from Andy, there are three other immortal warriors we know of. There is Nikki, aka Nicola of Genoa, and there is also Joe, aka Yusuf Ibn Ibrahim Ibn Muhammad Ibn al Qasani. I'm gonna be sticking to just Joe though. So Nikki and Joe, they actually met each other during the First Crusade. Nikki on the side of the Christians, and Joe on the side of the Muslims. The two of them fought and 
killed each other on the battlefield. Only they both came back to life. So then they killed each other again. And no matter what either of them did, they couldn't keep the other one dead. Eventually they realized what was happening, that the both of them were immortal. And the two of them, they ended up staying together, traveling together, and eventually became lovers. And to this day, the two of them are still together, and they have been together for over a thousand years. There is Booker. His original name was Sebastian Lelivre. He is the youngest, just over 200 or so years old. He is French. He was a counterfeiter. He was caught, though, and was given the option of either prison or go to war and fight for Napoleon against Russia. So, Booker went to war. Napoleon marched the French into Russian territory. But it was a lost cause, the war. The French could not handle the cold Russian winters. Many of the other French soldiers deserted. Eventually, Booker himself tried to desert the war, but the French captured him and hung him with the other deserters as an example for the others to keep fighting. Booker, he was hung, but he came back to life. He was just hanging there. So he played dead, and he stayed up there hanging for three days until the French army finally moved on. Eventually, at some point, Andy, Nicky, Joe, and Booker all found each other, and they stuck together and formed a kind of team. They don't know why they were chosen and why they are immortal, but the four of them together at least have company. They have a family of sorts that won't just die like all their mortal family members over the years. They can all watch each other's backs, and they can also perhaps try and do some good in the world. Old Guard Opening Fire Chapter 1 Andy has been alive for thousands of years. She kills people, she has sex, she kills time. She is so tired of it all, but it never ends. Now in the current day, Andy has some anonymous, casual, unsatisfying sex with some stranger and then she leaves. Andy is in Barcelona and she meets the rest of her team for some coffee. They are all there, Andy, Booker, Nikki, and Joe. Andy is the leader of the group because she is by far the oldest. They discuss a man named James Copley and how this James Copley wishes to meet with them for a mission. James Copley is ex-CIA and they did a job for him about eight years ago. They don't normally do repeat missions, but Copley's new mission involves a hostage situation and there are kids involved. so. Andy, she agrees to hear this Copley out. In Paris, Andy and Nikki go to meet this ex-CIA agent, James Copley. He tells them about a situation in South Sudan, which is in northern Africa. A group of terrorists attacked a school, killed the teachers, and abducted 17 students at gunpoint. Copley gives them the info. He wants them to retrieve the student hostages. Copley tells them to name their price. Andy, she agrees to the mission, and she tells Copley, We'll be in touch when it's done. We'll bill you then. We jump over to Afghanistan. We are being introduced to a new character. Her name is Niall Freeman. She is an African-American woman and a soldier in the U.S. military. She is a Marine. She's on a mission, looking for a terrorist that is hiding among some women and children in the village. Niall and her fellow Marines show the terrorist's image to some Afghani woman. The Afghani woman says that there is no man here, but she kind of hints that the terrorist is in fact in the next room. So Niall and her team approach the door, but they come under some gunfire. So they kick in the door and fire back and shoot the terrorist. Niall then goes over to the terrorist who is shot and is now bleeding out. She is trying to save his life and keep him alive. So that they can get some information from him. But as Niall is tending to the man's wounds, he stabs her with a hidden knife, and then he slices her throat with it, and Niall appears to have died. We jump to South Sudan. Andy and her team arrive and are in their military clothing. They stealthily approach 
the fenced-in facility where the hostages are supposedly being kept. They proceed into an underground bunker. They enter a room in the basement that is well lit. These are where the hostages are supposed to be. Instead, though, they find eight doors, four on each side, and on the opposite wall is a small table with a camcorder on it recording. All of a sudden, dozens of men pile out of the doors and begin opening fire on Andy and her team. They are just machine gunning Andy and her teammates to death, really just firing over and over into them, emptying their clips. Andy's brains are exposed. Joe's eye appears to have popped out of his head. But Andy and team are still alive. They can't die after all. They begin firing back and kill all of their attackers. Once all the attackers are dead, Andy and team search for the supposed student hostages. There are of course none. This was all a setup. They see the camcorder, and it was remotely sending the video somewhere off-site. Copley, the ex-CIA agent, he appears to have set them up for whatever reason. He wanted video proof of their abilities to not be able to die. Booker tells the group, we've been made. Back to Afghanistan. Niall Freeman, she got stabbed, and her throat was slit. For all intensive purposes, she should be dead. But somehow, Back in the medical barracks at base, she is alive again, and is sitting up, and she has no scar on her neck. Niall is a little confused that she is feeling fine, because Niall is an immortal warrior as well. Not that she knows it though, and this was her first death. Old Guard Opening Fire Chapter 2 Andy and her teammates have retreated to a hangar where they are now safe. They are going to have an ally of theirs named Wei fly them somewhere. For now though, they are resting. Nikki and Joe are sleeping together, Andy is smoking, and Booker is on a laptop trying to find out any info on this Copley who double-crossed them. Whenever there is a new immortal in the world, they tend to dream of each other. And Andy, she dozes off for a bit and she dreams of Niall. She dreams of Niall's death, of getting her throat slit. And when Andy wakes up, she is upset that there is this new immortal in the world. Nikki dreamt of this Niall as well. The two of them collaborate and share their dreams and figure out that this Niall woman is a new immortal or relic. Her name is Niall Freeman. She's a Marine and she is in Afghanistan. Andy doesn't want to retrieve her. There's all this stuff going on with Copley screwing them over and their cover being blown. But the rest of her team says that Andy has to retrieve her. They can't have one of their own out there in the wind, out in the open. So Andy, she reluctantly says that she will travel to Afghanistan and retrieve this Nile woman. She tells the rest of her team that she will meet them at the safe house in Paris. Elsewhere. We meet a man named Steve Merrick. He is a evil businessman and the main bad guy of Volume 1. He has tattoos all over his body and is lifting weights. He has his main henchman named Mr. Kiley with him. Steve Merrick is talking with James Copley, the CIA guy. Copley showed Merrick the recording of Andy and her team getting shot repeatedly but still being alive. She also showed Merrick plenty of other historical research he has done, proving Andy and her team's immortality and how they've been alive throughout the ages. The whole operation in South Sudan was done purely to capture them on tape, to prove that they were these immortal warriors. The whole operation cost this Mr. Merrick three million. Merrick believes James Copley now, though, that Andy and her team are immortal. And now, he wants James Copley to deliver one of them to him, so he can have his people research them and perhaps discover the secret to living forever. Over in Afghanistan, Andy goes to the US military base and knocks Niall out 
and drives her out into the Afghani desert. Andy then tries to explain to Niall about her immortality and the dreams that she was perhaps having. Niall was perhaps dreaming of Andy or the other members of Andy's crew? Niall, she doesn't believe Andy at all, though, so Andy, frustrated and impatient, shoots Niall in the head, and Niall dies, but then she comes back to life. When Niall awakes again, Andy, exasperated, says, Took you long enough. It's so slow coming back the first couple of times. You gonna behave now, or I gotta shoot you again? Niall is apprehensive, but she travels with Andy. The two of them slowly, over many hours, make their way to Paris. Along the way, Andy explains to Niall all about her new life, how Niall can't die. Well, for the most part. One day she'll die, and that'll be it. But for now, she will live for a long time. Andy explains that there are five of them now, including the two of them. Andy also explains how she has been alive for a very long time. So long that she is old enough to have forgotten the people who once loved her. Niall, she looks at a picture of her own family on her phone, and Andy tells her that she should just forget her family now. Andy says if she really loves them, she will just let them think that she has gone AWOL from the military and has gone missing. For their sake, not for hers. Andy says she will explain more later, and she tells Niall to talk to this guy Booker. He'll tell her why she should avoid her family. Andy and Niall arrive at the Paris safe house, which looks like a rundown crack house, and they are here to regroup with the rest of the team. Only something is not right. There has been a gunfire fight. Joe and Nikki have been taken, and Booker is lying on the floor with his head blown off, and he appears dead. Old Guard Opening Fire Chapter 3 Booker, he ain't dead though. His head successfully regrows. Booker explains to Andy that him, Joe, and Nikki were all watching a soccer game when the door blasted open. A flashbang was thrown in guns were fired and Booker's head was blown off. And when everything was over, Joe and Nikki were gone. They were taken. Why was Booker left behind, though? Andy, she figures that Booker was left behind as bait. And with that realization, she goes into action mode. She figures the attackers are still nearby. She tells Niall and Booker to wait for her signal. And then she goes out into the hallway and checks out the stairwell, and sure enough, there are other soldiers there, and they try and shoot at Andy. Andy, though, she starts taking them out. She's running down the stairwell, jumping down the stairs, flipping, dodging bullets, killing every soldier in sight. Back in the apartment, Booker and Niall are waiting for Andy's signal for them to leave. They hear tons of gunfire and killing coming from outside the apartment door. Niall begins panicking, but Booker tells her to wait. Andy hasn't given them the signal yet, and Niall yells, how can you tell? All of a sudden though, there is a massive explosion in their apartment, and the wall crumbles down and is gone. That is the signal. Niall and Booker, they leave their apartment's room and walk through the apartment complex, stepping over tons of dead soldiers that Andy killed. When they get outside, Andy is waiting for them in a car, and they all drive off. We see Joe and Nikki have been taken prisoner, and they are in a military van, with various soldiers pointing guns at them. Joe is worried because Nikki seems hurt and in rough shape. The soldiers there, though, they mock Joe and say, Aw, that's sweet. Is he your boyfriend? Joe and Nikki. They have been in a romantic relationship for over a thousand years. And Joe tells the soldier, You are a child, an infant, and your mocking is thus infantile. That man is not my boyfriend. That man is more to me than you can dream in your simpering, pathetic life. That man is the stars in my sky and the sun that lights my days. 
That man is the moon when I am lost in darkness, and warmth when I shiver in cold. I love that man beyond measure and reason. His kiss still thrills me, even after a millennium since I first tasted him. His body to this day awakens a passion you will never know. His heart overflows with the kindness of which this world is not worthy. His very thoughts make music of the mundane. He is not my boyfriend. He is not my lover. Nor is he my partner. He is all and more. He is my everything. Nikki tells Joe, oh, you incurable romantic. And the two of them kiss as it pisses off all the soldiers in the van. When the military van pulls up into the hangar and the door is open, Joe and Nikki have killed everyone else inside. And they kind of smile at their captors. The other soldiers in the hangar drag them out. And Joe and Nikki see James Copley there. And Nikki says to Copley, Can I assume we're being taken to meet the person who's paying you for your betrayal? Copley says he didn't betray them. They should have been honest with him from the start about what they were, and then none of this would have happened. Elsewhere, Andy is driving, and Niall and Booker are passengers. Niall asks Booker, so what happened to his family? Andy told her that she should ask him about it. Andy wants Booker to explain to Niall why she should forget her family. Booker explains to her, The real reason is to protect your heart. You will watch all of them die, Niall. You will watch everyone you have ever loved pass away. And if you try to touch their lives, they will ask questions. And through your answers, they will learn your secret. And they will ask you to share it with them. And you will not be able to. And they will curse your name. They will beg and they will implore. They will not believe you when you say you cannot help them. And then they will grow desperate. And in desperation, they will do things to forever taint your memory of them. And they will still die. And you will never forget what they became before they did. I thought this was a fascinating take on what could happen when you live forever. I know one aspect is that you will see your family and loved ones die, but I never thought of the possibility of your family members growing resentful and potentially being angry with you and desperate as they approach death, but you can't seem to share your gift with them and you continue on living. I still don't think what happened to Booker would happen all the time though, and I'm not fully convinced it means that this Nile woman should cut her family out of her life forever, but it is an interesting argument about why Niall should let her family believe she has died. The three of them, Andy, Niall, and Booker, arrive at Andy's other safe house hiding place. It is some sort of secret, underground catacomb that they discovered in the 1150s. In this underground room, we see old skulls as well as many historical items such as knight armor, swords and shields, old chalices, as well as a motorcycle. Old Guard Opening Fire Chapter 4 Niall is looking at a picture of her family, her mom and her brother, and she cries at the prospect of never seeing them again. Andy comments looking at the picture that Niall's brother is pretty hot. Niall gets angry and says, no way, nuh-uh, you're old enough to be his grams a hundred times over. Andy shares that she doesn't remember what her mother or any of her sisters even looked like. None of the people in their group has pictures of their family. Andy tells Niall to keep that picture safe. Andy, she thinks to herself, time. Time takes everything, just not all at once. Andy remembers one of her past loves, a black man named Achilles. Achilles was a slave who was captured in Africa and sent to America. He lived in Virginia during the Revolutionary War. The British offered freedom to any slave who fought for them. Achilles, he liked the sound of that. So he joined up with the British. The British lost the war, but Achilles retreated back to London with them. 
Although in London, he wasn't really welcomed there either. He got arrested for stealing food. He had been starving. So, they put Achilles on another ship. This one bound for Australia to their penal colony. Once he was there in Australia, he escaped and became a bandit. And that is where Achilles met Andy. They met at gunpoint. The two of them pointing their pistols at each other. They ended up becoming a team and they robbed people together and they made a life for each other. They built a cabin and had a farm and they ended up living happily ever after until Achilles reached old age. Achilles, he was getting old and Andy, she stayed the same young looking age. Achilles never asked her why he was getting older and she wasn't. One day though, they had an argument. He told her that she had to leave before someone came around and started asking them questions that they couldn't answer. They fought about it, but Andy knew that he was right, and she left, and she never saw him again. She still remembers her love, Achilles, fondly. Niall is looking through the secret base Andy has brought her to, and she notices all of these historical artifacts. Andy has a Rodan sculpture. And Andy says, yeah, that sounds about right. Niall is surprised. Did Rodan just give this to her? Booker jokes that Andy probably knew Rodan biblically, implying that they were banging. Niall looks at everything in the room and comments that this stuff is probably worth half a million bucks easy. Niall reveals that she was going to study art history when she got out of the Marines. That is why she notices all the value in these things. Niall eventually spots a painting of Andy with her lover Achilles, and she asks Sandy, is that you in the picture? And Andy covers up the painting and says that it is somebody else. They all turn their attention now to finding Joe and Nikki. Niall asks, can't they just dream and find them that way, like when they found her? Andy says that the dreams only come when there is someone new. It's how they know to search for each other, but... Once they find each other, the dreams stop. Booker on his laptop, he's on the internet, and he finds out that this Copley has an office in Dubai. He has a business there called Veritas Assessments. Booker figures that this is perhaps a good place for them to try first. Try to get answers from Copley, see if they can find out where Joe and Nikki are. Over in Dubai, Joe and Nikki are brought to meet Steve Merrick. Merrick reveals he is a ruthless businessman. He runs hedge funds and made lots of his money in big pharmaceuticals. He tells them, you guys have something I want and I'm pretty dogged when it comes to getting what I want. You guys don't die. I mean, holy shit, right? Immortality, man. That's like mankind's oldest dream to never die. Merrick, he wants to know their secret. It could be worth a fortune to him. He introduces them to his scientist, a man named Dr. Ivan. Ivan will get him the answers that he needs any way he can. Joe and Nikki, they turn violent and attack. They try and escape, but they are outnumbered. They get shot by Merrick's guards. And in the end, Merrick, he has a knife and he gleefully stabs Joe and Nikki over and over and over again. He seems to be enjoying himself a little bit too much. He is just fascinated when they are bleeding and start healing and coming back to life. Merrick wipes the blood off his hands and orders his men to take Joe and Nikki to the doctor's suite to begin their work. Copley, he is there and he is a little bit disgusted with Merrick's glee in stabbing Joe and Nikki. Merrick tells Copley, don't look at me like that, like you never wanted to try that yourself. Later on, Andy, Booker, and Niall have made their way to Dubai. They are at the large office building where James Copley's office is. Niall asks if Booker is sure this is the place. Booker says according to the website it is. Niall comments, well, it's a good thing he has that laptop with him then. Booker says that he is the only one in their group who can use a computer. Andy, she gets confused using her phone. They go into the office building with not much of a plan. 
Andy just tells them to follow her lead. The three now inside approach the guard at the front desk. Andy knocks him out and Niall hops on the computer and turns off the security in the building. The three then head to the elevator and go upstairs. Before they do though, Niall and Andy have a few moments by themselves while Booker is away and occupied. Niall questions Booker's ability to find James Copley's office on the internet. Something about it doesn't add up, and because of Andy's naivete regarding computers and the internet, she might not be aware that Booker was bullshitting her. Niall says to Andy, I gotta ask you a question about Booker. Just because you've got a computer doesn't mean you're on the internet. It doesn't work like that. Booker was connecting to the web in that damn cave we were in? No way. Just then though, before we can explore this further, Booker arrives and joins them, and the three of them take the elevator upstairs. They charge through the Veritas security and assessments door, and they find James Copley there. Andy points a gun on him and asks him where Joe and Nicky are. Copley, he makes eye contact with Booker and says, Booker? Booker replies, right. Booker then shoots Andy. Booker has double-crossed her. Niall says, I knew it, you son of a bitch. Then she gets shot too. Andy asks Booker, what is he trying to do here? And Booker replies, I'm trying to end it, Andy. That's all I'm trying to do. Old Guard Opening Fire Chapter 5 Andy on the floor is bleeding from her neck, but it slowly heals over time. She is in shock that Booker has betrayed her. Eventually, she stands back up. She exchanges some words with Copley. Copley reveals that he plans on delivering Andy to his employer, who is right here in Dubai. Andy asks, and this is the guy who's cutting them up to see what makes them tick? Copley says, Andy. And Andy continues, but that is what he's doing, right? And what he's going to do to us too, right? I mean, that's what this is all about. And Copley responds, of course that's what this is all about. How old are you anyway? How old is Nikki or Joe? Andy says that she is 6,732 years old, give or take a handful. She then launches a surprise attack on Booker and tosses him to the floor. Niall dives for a handgun on the ground. She grabs it and fires on some of the guards that are now in the room. When it is all done, Niall and Andy are the only ones left standing. Copley's guards are all dead. Booker is on the ground and Copley, he is still alive. Andy, she points her gun at Copley now and tells him, you lied to me, you lied to my team. You took what you knew and instead of honoring the secret you discovered, you sold it. How do I let you live, Copley? Copley tells her, There's another 30 guys on the way up here right now, Andy. The whole building is on lockdown. If I live, maybe I can help you, and you're gonna need it. There's no way out. You're caught. Andy, she's not worried. She knows there is another way out. She shoots the glass window behind Copley, and she decides that she is not going to kill him. She tells him, that was my last ounce of mercy. Don't make me regret it. Andy and Niall walk over to the window, dragging Booker with them. They are on the 34th floor of this building, staring at the ground through the window. Those 30 security guards storm into the room. Andy, Niall, and Booker all jump. The three of them smash down on the street below, their bodies exploding on impact, but they all heal and they get away. Elsewhere in Dubai, Steve Merrick is pissed. He is talking to his scientist, Dr. Ivan, and Dr. Ivan is getting nowhere with Joe and Nikki. He can't explain how they are immortal. Andy, Niall, and Booker have drove somewhere safe for now, and they stop the car, and Andy starts slapping Booker around. They both begin shooting at each other and having a conversation while the shooting is going on. Booker explains the reason that he betrayed Andy and the rest of them. It was because 
Copley promised that this guy, Steve Merrick, could figure out why they keep on living. And he thought he could figure out how to make it stop for them so that they could finally die. He tells Andy, you know why I did it. We want the same thing. My family hated me by the time the last of them died. And we see a flashback. Booker was with the youngest of his four sons. That son was now an old man and was dying of cancer. And he yelled at his dad for not being able to help him live. Booker then tells Andy, you think I haven't seen it? Watching you drink and screw away every endless night? Life means nothing if it isn't worth living. Booker says he just wanted it to stop. He wanted a way to make all the years, all the memories, all the loss, all the loneliness, all of it, just stop. Andy, after hearing all this, tells Booker, that's not what she wants. She wants something to live for. And right now, that's the people on her team. She asks Booker, does he know where they can find this Merrick and where he's got Nikki and Joe? And is Booker going to help her get them back? Booker, sad and maybe regretful of his decision to betray her and the other says, yes, he knows where they are and he will help. They begin heading out to go save them, but before they do, Andy tells Booker, you're going to have to own this, Booker, but that's for after. But you're going to have to own what you've done, you understand? And Booker answers, I do. Andy, Booker, and Niall go to another office tower in Dubai, this one owned by Steve Merrick. Merrick knows that Andy might be coming for him now. Merrick, he's angry that Copley isn't here. He phones Copley and tells him to get his ass over here. Copley, though, since Andy showed him mercy and let him live, has started to feel bad about his actions, and he decides to change sides and no longer work for Merrick. Copley tells Merrick that no, he isn't coming and that he quits. Merrick threatens that he will destroy Copley, and Copley replies, no, you won't. You won't live long enough for that. All of a sudden, an explosion goes off in the lobby of Merrick's building. Andy has arrived with the others. Copley, hearing it through the phone, tells Merrick, ah, that would be her. Wish I could say it's been nice knowing you, but... It really hasn't. He hangs up and calls him an asshole. Down in the lobby, wearing burkas, Andy, Niall, and Booker make their way to an elevator and head up. When the elevator doors open at the top floor, many guards with machine guns are waiting for them. Andy, Niall, and Booker step out of the elevator and begin blasting away. Stuff is really popping off now. Inside the room where Dr. Ivan has been running experiments on Joe and Nikki, he hears all of the shooting happening outside, and he's a little bit concerned by it. Joe and Nikki tell Dr. Ivan that Andy will kill him for sure once she finds him. Unless he were to maybe, you know, do the right thing right now and let them go. Dr. Ivan, weighing his options, decides to let them go and he tells them to tell Andy that he freed them and to spare him. Joe and Nikki, though, once they're free, they don't care. They break Dr. Ivan's neck, killing him. Joe and Nikki then rejoin Andy, Niall, and Booker, and the five of them all together get to work, killing everybody and attacking them, just blasting away. A good old-fashioned gunfight. They blast through everyone, and eventually there is only one person left to kill, the boss. Steve Merrick. They find him cowering, hiding in the bathroom on the floor. The five of them stand around him and blast away at him, killing him. And with that, they are done. Days or weeks later, Andy and team have traveled to the small European island country of Malta. Andy, Joe, and Nikki are discussing what to do about Booker. They are arguing Booker double-crossed them. There has to be a punishment. Niall and Booker are down by some docks, talking elsewhere. Booker tells Niall that it's not like they can kill me for what I did. Booker tells her, you're a good kid, Niall. You're going to be good for the team. They're going to need you, too. World's gotten way too complicated. 
Niall asks Booker, what will he do? And he answers, live. Later on that night, Andy finally goes down to the docks to talk with Booker and tell him the team's decision. She tells Booker, there's gotta be a price. Booker says, I know. Andy continues, if you weren't one of us, I'd have killed you already. And Booker says, I know that too. Andy tells Booker his punishment. She says, 100 years from today, we meet again here. Until then, you're alone. So for 100 years, Booker will be away from them. That is kind of a punishment. They are his oldest friends. And now he is alone. Andy leaves. She rejoins Niall, Joe, and Nikki. And all of them walk off down the street, leaving Booker behind. And that is the end of Volume 1, Opening Fire. Alright, so that was Volume 1, and I quite enjoyed this volume. I thought the artwork was pretty good. I liked the exploration of the immortality concept. Seeing these characters kind of being over, being immortal. Not really liking it. Kind of whining a little bit about being immortal. I don't know. I wouldn't mind living forever, or for at least a long, long time. But everyone here kind of just hates it. But anyway, it's interesting to see that explored. I liked the action in this volume and the bad guys and the overall concept. I gotta say, though, it was maybe a little bit cliche a bit. Some of the characters, like the bad guy, he's just this evil businessman that wants to profit off of these people and various things like that within this book. But I had a good time and I liked how the book ended, how this booker, he betrayed his group, but now he sort of is done and What's going to happen to him now? So they sort of just cast him out for the next hundred years. And in volume two, we're going to see the fallout of that. What happens to Booker? What happens to the rest of the group? And we're going to also introduce some uh, other characters back into the series. So it's going to be interesting to see where they all go in volume two. I'm going to give volume one a seven and a half out of ten. Not perfect, but pretty fun. Now, with regards to the movie, I thought it was not bad. I really liked the casting of Charlize Theron. She is an A-list star, and she is great, and she does carry a lot of that movie. I would say the movie does a pretty good job of staying close to the source material. I would say it is about 90% the same, which is pretty good. There is a few tweaks here and there. They do go in a little bit of a different direction with Andy's character at the end of the movie that I don't want to spoil here. But overall, it's staying pretty close, which is nice. Something about the movie, though, just stops it from being amazing. I think the director was maybe not the best choice. The action sequences weren't as great as they could have been. And some of the music choices were maybe not the best as well. But still, I think the movie was pretty okay. Not too bad. I would give the movie a 7 out of 10. Alright, thank you for watching. That has been book 1 of The Old Guard, and next week I will be back with book 2.